Okay, Shoshanin. In the 90s, 1990s, <laughs> I coined many, many phrases. And among them, abuse by proxy and flying monkeys. But what happens when your children become flying monkeys? When the abuser, the narcissist, leverages his access to your children, his influence for your children, on your children, the fact that sometimes he's a role model for your children. What happens when the abuser abuses the legal system and then takes away your children from you, uses what is colloquially known as parental alienation and transforms them into flying monkeys at his service, vectors through which the abuser imparts trauma, pain, and additional maltreatment. What happens when your children become your worst enemies? This is the topic of today's video. As distinct from other videos, which are highly academic, <laughs> this one includes also a lot of practical advice as to how to behave and what to do. And I hope that you find all this altogether useful and helpful. My name, for those of you who don't know, luckily for you, is Sam Vaknin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. Um, I am also a former visiting professor of psychology, and I'm on the faculty of CIAPS, Commonwealth for International Advanced Professional Studies. So let us delve right in. Abuse by proxy is any situation where the abuser uses other people to perpetuate the abuse, amplify it, magnify it, and inflict it upon the victim in a barrage of um, hostility, animosity, gossip, smear campaigns, and so on, ganging up on the victim or denying the victim protection when she is attacked by others is a form of subtle uh, abuse by proxy. Socially isolating and excluding the victim by discrediting her through a campaign of malicious rumors, a smear campaign, it's another form of abuse by proxy because it makes use of social structures, reputational, reputational damages, and the ability to kind of instill shame and guilt in the victim vis-a-vis -vis her nearest and dearest, close ones, friends, family, and the wider social circles that she moves in. I keep saying she, but of course the victim could easily be a he. About half of all narcissists are women nowadays, unfortunately. Ha harassing the victim by using other people to stalk her or by charging her with offenses, including criminal offenses, that she did not commit at all. These are also forms of abuse by proxy, because here the legal system, the police, the courts, they are abused. They, are, they serve as a way to diminish the victim, threaten her, endanger her, and punish her for things she has never done, provoking the victim into aggressive or even antisocial conduct by having other people threaten her or her loved ones colluding with other people to render the victim dependent on the abuser. But by far, the children, the victim's children, are the abuser's greatest source of leverage over his abused spouse, or mate, or girlfriend, or boyfriend, or ex, or just a random target, a former friend, former colleague, co-worker, and so on. Children are the best form, the most efficacious form of flying monkeys because children are never suspected. There's an assumption or a presumption of innocence when it comes to children. Children are easily manipulated, 
and formed and reformed. Children are like guided missiles. They strike at the very heart of the victim. They dysregulate her emotionally and they cause unimaginable hurt. The abuser often recruits his children, and again, his, her, as many abusers are women as are men. But I'm going to continue with the Victorian literary norm or tradition of using he for mankind. The abuser often recruits his children to do his bidding. The abuser uses his children to tempt, convince, communicate, threaten, and otherwise manipulate his target, the victim. The target is usually the children's other parent or some devoted relative, such as a grandparent, but it could easily be a teacher, even peers of the child. The abuser controls his often gullible and unsuspecting offspring exactly as he plans to control his ultimate prey. The abuser employs the same mechanisms and devices in both cases, and in this sense, the children are being victimized. Even as the children serve, end up serving as flying monkeys, even if, as they inflict pain and hurt on the ultimate target, they are victims. Exactly like guided missiles or cruise missiles, they end up exploding. And then, the abuser dumps his props unceremoniously when the job is done. Expiry date. <laughs> the children have an expiry date. They're no longer useful. And this causes tremendous and typically irreversible emotional hurt. There are several strat strategies that the abuser uses when he attempts to convert his children into, as I said, cruise missiles or flying monkeys. The first one is co-opting. Some offenders, some abusers, mainly in patriarchal, conservative and misogynist societies, they co-opt their children into aiding and abetting their abusive conduct. The couple's children are used as bargaining chips or leverage. They are instructed and they are encouraged by the abuser to shun the victim, criticize her, disagree with her, withhold love and affection, inflict on her various forms of ambient abuse and gaslighting, and in many cases, just straightforward lie about her. So, and in these societies, this is considered good practice, socially acceptable, a social mori. As I wrote elsewhere in Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, even the victim's children are amenable to the considerable charm, persuasiveness, and manipulativeness of the abuser and to his impressive thespian skills, acting skills. The abuser offers a plausible rendition of the events and interprets them to his favor. The victims are often on the verge of a nervous breakdown. They are harassed unkempt, irritable, impatient, abrasive, and hysterical. Confronted with this contrast between a polished, self-controlled, and suave abuser and his harried casualties, it is easy to reach the wrong conclusion, the erroneous conclusion, that the real victim is the abuser, or that both parties somehow are equally responsible and equally abuse each other, equally mistreat each other. The praise acts of self-defense, assertiveness, or insistence on her rights are interpreted as reactive abuse, aggression, lability, or a mental health problem. She is crazy. And this is especially true with young and therefore impressionable and vulnerable children, offspring, common children, particularly if they happen to live with the abuser or if he has custody rights over them or if he has very frequent visitation rights. Children are frequently emotionally blackmailed by the abuser. If you want daddy to love you, do this or refrain from doing that. If you want mommy to love you, 
never mention daddy. Daddy is a bad person. Children lack life experience and adult defenses against manipulation. They may be dependent on the abuser economically, and they always resent the abused, the victim, for having broken up the family, for being unable to fully cater to their needs because she has to work for a living, and for cheating on her abusive ex with a new boyfriend or a new husband. So there is a lot of ground the abuser can cover with the children, many levers that the abuser can pull in order to turn the children against the victimized spouse. And this is known colloquially, again, as parental alienation syndrome. There's no such syndrome, but the process definitely exists. The abuser can co-opt not only the children, but often the system. The abuser perverts and subverts the system. Therapists, marriage counselors, mediators, court-appointed guardians and evaluators, police officers and judges, especially in family courts. The abuser uses, uses all these functionaries to pathologize the victim and to separate her from her sources of emotional sustenance, most notably from her children. The abuser seeks custody in order to hurt and pain his ex, in order to punish her. And this leads very often to threatening behavior. <clears throat> Abusers are insatiable and vindictive. They always feel deprived, unfairly treated, having been victimized. Some abusers are paranoid and sadistic. If they fail to manipulate their common children into abandoning the other parent, they begin to treat the children as enemies, the secretary objects. Such abusers are not above threatening the children, abducting them, abusing them sexually, physically, or psychologically, verbally, outright harming them in order to get back at the erstwhile partner or in order to make her do something or refrain from doing something. Most victims attempt to present to their children a balanced picture of their relationship and of the abusive spouse. He needs his father, they would say, or she needs a mother. I would never speak ill of my partner in front of the children. I would never badmouth them. It is a vain attempt to avoid the notorious and controversial parental alienation syndrome, PAS. And so they do not besmirch the abusive parent. They do not criticize the abusive parent. And on the contrary, they encourage the semblance of a normal functional liaison, a good connection. And this is, of course, the utterly wrong approach. Not only is it counterproductive, it sometimes proves outright dangerous for the child. Most victims attempt to present to their children uh, the other parent as normal and healthy. But children have a right to know the overall state of affairs between their parents. Children have a right to not be cheated and deluded into thinking that everything is basically okay and the abusive partner is just another parent or that the separation is somehow reversible. Both parents are under mo a moral obligation to tell their offspring the truth. The relationship is over for good. Younger kids tend to believe that they're somehow responsible or guilty for the breakdown of the marriage or the couple, and they must be disabused of this notion. They must be told that they are not responsible and not guilty, it's not their fault. Both parents would do best to explain to the children in straightforward terms what led to the dissolution of the bond, what terminated the marriage, what resulted in the breakup. If spousal abuse is wholly or partly to blame for the dissolution of the marriage and the breakup and the heartbreak, then 
spousal abuse, the issue of spousal abuse, should be brought out to the open and discussed honestly with the children. In such conversations, it is best not to allocate blame, but this does not mean that wrong behaviors should be excused or condoned or whitewashed or overlooked. The victimized parent should tell the child that abusive conduct is always wrong, must always be avoided. The child should be taught how to identify the warning signs of impending abuse, especially sexual abuse, but also verbal, psychological, and physical. And moreover, a responsible parent should teach the child how to resist inappropriate and hurtful actions. The child should be brought up to insist on being respected by the other parent, on having him or her observe and respect the child's boundaries and accept the child's needs, emotions, choices and preferences. In short, the child should be brought up to force the other abusive parent to accept, to embrace the child's separateness and externality, especially if the abusive parent happens to be a narcissist. The child should learn to say no, to walk away from potentially compromising situations with the abusive parent. The child should be brought up to not feel guilty for protecting itself and for demanding her, his or her rights. Remember this, an abusive parent, and especially a narcissist, is dangerous to your child, and you must protect your child from this danger at any cost, as you would protect the child from other dangers. Idealization and evaluation cycles. Most abusers accord the same treatment to children as they do to adults. Don't forget, narcissistic abusers are children, emotionally speaking. They're like the child's peers. They do not fulfill parental functions. They are irresponsible. They're unreliable and cannot be trusted because they're children. And they treat children and adults the very same way they regard both children and adults as sources of narcissistic supply mere instruments or tools of gratification they idealize the children at first and then they devalue the children in favor of alternative safer and more subservient sources in such treatment being idealized and then dumped and devalued and discarded is traumatic it can have long-lasting emotional effects on the child. And then there's the issue of jealousy. Some abusers are jealous of their offspring. We all know the stereotypical mother who competes with her teenage daughter for attention, including sexual attention. The abusive parent, the narcissistic parent, envies the child for being the center of attention and care. This kind of parents abusive and narcissistic, treat their own kids as hostile competitors, where the uninhibited expression of the aggression and hostility aroused by this predicament is illegitimate or impossible, the abuser prefers to stay away from the child altogether. Rather than attack his children, the abuser sometimes immediately disconnects, detaches himself emotionally, becomes cold and uninterested or directs transformed anger at his mate or at his the child's parents, the more legitimate uh, targets. The abuser's relationship with his children involves very many pathological mechanisms and vectors. Objectification, for example. Sometimes the child is perceived to be a mere bargaining chip in a drawn out battle with the erstwhile victim of the abuser. This is an extension of the abuser's tendency to dehumanize people and treat them as instruments or objects or extensions of himself. And such abusive partners, such narcissistic partners, seek to manipulate their former mates and spouses by taking over 
in monopolizing the common children. They foster an atmosphere of emotional and, very often, bodily incest. Incest. The abusive parent encourages his kids or her kids to idolize him, to adore him, to be awed by him, to admire his deeds and capabilities, to learn to blindly trust and obey him, and in short, to surrender to his charisma and to become submerged in his folie de, in his delusion, in his shared fantasy. The abuser encourages his children to remain dependent, denies their emerging personal autonomy, and obliterates their agency. They are not allowed to separate and individuate, rebel, think critically, and become in any way, shape, or form their own person. There's a breach of personal boundaries. I mentioned incest. It is at this stage that the risk of child abuse, up to and including outright incest, sexual violation, at this stage, this risk is heightened. Many abusers are autoerotic. They are the preferred objects of their own sexual attentions. Molesting or having intercourse with one's children is as close as one gets to having sex with oneself. When you have sex with your child, you're having sex with 50% of yourself. This is very alluring, seductive and irresistible to many narcissists because it's the ultimate autoerotic act. Abusers often perceive sex in terms of annexation and a power play. The molested child is assimilated, becomes an extension of the offender, a fully controlled and manipulated object. Sex to the abuser is the ultimate act of depersonalization and objectification of the other. The abuser actually masturbates with the child's body. The abuser's inability to acknowledge and abide by the personal boundaries set by other people puts the child at a heightened risk of abuse. Many abusers are defiant, consummatious, they abhor and reject authority. They are their own, they are a law unto themselves. They don't abide by anyone's rules. And so there's a very high risk of verbal, emotional, physical, and often sexual abuse that consists of a breach of boundaries and a defiance and reckless attempt to break the law and all rules. The abuser's possessiveness and panoply of indiscriminate negative emotional, negative affectivity, negative emotions. All these transformations of aggression, rage, envy, they hinder the abuser's ability to act as a good enough parent. The abuser's propensity for reckless behavior, substance abuse, and sexual deviance endanger the child's welfare or even the child's life. This, the relationship between, the, between children and their abusive parent or narcissistic parent is always conflictual. Even when the child adores and admires the abusive parent, even when the child attempts to emulate the narcissistic parent, even when the narcissistic parent becomes the child's role model, there's still an underlying current of conflict because minors pose little danger of criticizing the abuser and confronting him. They are perfect, they're malleable, and they're abundant sources of narcissistic supply. So the narcissistic parent derives gratification from having an incestuous, emotionally incestuous or physically incestuous relations with adulating, physically and mentally inferior, inexperienced and dependent bodies, his children. And yet, the older the offspring get, the more they become critical, even judgmental, of the abusive and narcissistic parent. Grown-up children, older children, let's say on the cusp of adolescence and later, are better equipped, better able to put into context and perspective the abusive parents' actions, to question the narcissistic parents' motives, 
to anticipate this kind of parents' moves. As they mature, these children often refuse to continue to play the mindless pawns in the abuser's chess game. They hold grudges against the abuser for what he has done to them in the past when they were less capable of resistance. They can gauge the abuser's true nature, true stature, true talents and accomplishments, which usually lag far behind the claims that the abuser makes in commensurate with them. And this brings the abusive parent back a full cycle. This mature, growing maturity of the child, this independent thinking or critical thinking, this autonomy, personal autonomy, growing personal autonomy, this push the abusive parent, the narcissistic parent, to, be, to adopt a different position vis-a-vis -vis his children. Again, the abusive parent perceives his sons or daughters as threats. He quickly becomes disillusioned. He devalues them. He loses all interest. He becomes emotionally, emotionally remote, absent and cold, rejecting and critical, refuses to communicate, citing life pressures and the preciousness and scarceness of his time. This is his way to passive aggressively punish his children for having dared to doubt him and question his motivation and actions. The abuser feels burdened, cornered, besieged, suffocated and claustrophobic by the responsibility over his children. He wants to get away. He wants to abandon, abandon his commitments, move, pass them on, um, because his children are now people who have become totally useless or even, even damaging to him. They challenge his grandiosity. They undermine his inflated, fantastic self-view. The abuser does not understand why he has to support these children, why he has to suffer their company, and he believes himself to have been deliberately and ruthlessly trapped by his former spouse or partner. And so the abuser rebels, either passive-aggressively, by refusing to act or intentionally sabotaging, sabotaging the relationships with his children, or actively by being ov overly critical, aggressive, unpleasant, verbally and psychologically abusive, physically abusive sometimes, slowly and to justify his actions to himself, the abuser gets immersed in conspiracy theories with clear paranoid use when it comes to his children and the other spouse. To his mind, the members of the family are conspiring against him. They seek to belittle or humiliate or subordinate him. They don't understand him. They stymie his growth. The abuser usually finally gets what he wants. His kids detach and abandon him to his great feigned sorrow, but actually to his enormous relief. If all else fails, the abuser recruits friends, colleagues, mates, family members, the authorities, institutions, neighbors, the media, teachers, in short, third parties, kind of flying monkeys, to do his bidding. He uses other people, institutions, social mores to cajole, coerce, threaten, stalk, offer, retreat, tempt, convince, harass, communicate, and otherwise manipulate his target. He controls these unaware instruments exactly as he plans to control his ultimate victim. He employs the same mechanism, same devices, and he dumps these people unceremoniously and abruptly when the job is done, as I mentioned before. And so a major form of vicarious uh, abuse or control by proxy is to engineer situations in which abuse is inflicted upon another person. Such carefully crafted scenarios of embarrassment, shaming, humiliation, provoke social sanctions, condemnation of the victim, opprobrium, physical punishment, chastising, against the victim. Society 
or a social group or an institution like the legal system become the instruments of the abuser. Abusers often use other people to do their dirty work for them in a variety of settings, not only in romantic or intimate relationships. And these sometimes unwitting accomplices largely belong to three groups. Number one, the abuser's social milieu. Some offenders, mainly in patriarchal and misogynist societies that I've mentioned, use the local culture, the local permissive culture, the culture that condones, encourages, justifies, excuses, and upholds abuse by proxy as a form of disciplining or instilling cultural and societal values, socialization. They use this in order to torture the victim and make sure that she, she doesn't stray out of line. So such societies and cultures aid and abet abusive conduct. The victim is held hostage, isolated and with little or no access to funds, transportation, a social network or her family and friends. This is known today in some countries in the West as coercive control and in one or two of them it's a criminal offence. Often the couple's children are used, as I said, as bargaining chip or leverage. Ambient abuse by the abuser's clan, kin, kith and village or neighbourhood is rampant in these societies and cultures. The victim's social milieu can also be used to inflict on her or to perpetuate abuse. Even the victim's relatives, friends and colleagues are amenable to the considerable charm, persuasiveness and manipulativeness of the abuser. The abuser offers a plausible rendition of the events. He interprets these events to his favor, in his favor. People rarely have a chance to witness, actually, an abusive exchange firsthand and at close quarters. It's a he said, she said situation. In contrast, the victims are often on the verge of a nervous breakdown. They don't look good, they look crazy. And confronted with this contrast, as I said, the victim is misjudged. And the abuser is widely considered to have, to have been the victim. The system itself is not immune to these misperceptions. The abuser uses elements of the system, as I mentioned, anything from therapists to police. He uses them to pathologize the victim, to separate her from sources of sustenance, and ultimately and especially from her children. And so, what can you what can you uh, what can you do about it? What how should you behave with your children in the face of such almost impossible to avoid um, behaviors and strategies? Narcissists are control freaks. They micromanage their children children's lives. And they turn them into sources of narcissistic supply to be discarded when they grow old and critical and, and so on and so forth. What can you do about it? Fighting the narcissist head on is a losing proposition and likely to get you estranged from your own children or even to lose them altogether in a custody battle. What you can do is modeling. Modeling is a theory in psychology. Bandura is its main proponent. proponent. Modeling says that the way to educate children, to raise them up, is to provide them with a good personal example, to show the child that not everyone is a narcissist. So you need to model. Your son or your daughter, they're likely to encounter narcissists in the future. In a way, they will be better prepared to cope with narcissists, more alert, to the existence of narcissists and narcissist she she can read. and being exposed to a narcissistic per parent renders the child more desensitized to narcissistic abuse in the future it's not it's not altogether bad it's not unadulterated evil there are good aspects to having been exposed to a narcissistic parent in early childhood 
And for this, you should be grateful. There is nothing much you can do otherwise. Stop wasting your money, your time, your energy, and your emotional resources on this intractable problem of how to insulate your, your children from the abusive parents or narcissistic parents' influence. You can't. It is a lost war, though it is a war in a just cause. Instead, make yourself available to your child. The only thing you can do to prevent your child from emulating his mother or father who are narcissistic is to present to the child another role model. You, the non-narcissist. Hopefully, when the child grows up, the child will prefer your model to the other parent's model. The child will make a choice between two models. He will choose the winning one. But there's only that much you can do. You cannot control the developmental path of your child. Exerting unlimited control over your child is what narcissism is all about. And it is exactly what you should avoid at all costs, however worried you might be. Narcissism does tend to breed, to breed narcissism or some other forms of dysfunction, but that is not inevitable. Not all the offspring of narcissists inexorably become narcissists. A narcissistic parent regards his or her child as a multifaceted source of narcissistic supply. The child is considered and treated as an extension of the narcissistic personality. It is true, the child, that the narcissist seeks to settle open, open scores with the world and with you especially. The child is supposed to realize the unfulfilled grandiose dreams to actualize the fantasies of the narcissist. The parent. The parent has broken dreams, unfulfilled wishes. It's a child's role to dedicate his life or her life to fulfilling these dreams. The, this life by proxy can develop in two possible ways. The narcissist can either merge with the child or the narcissist can become ambivalent towards the child. The ambivalence is a result of a conflict within the narcissist between his wish to attain his narcissistic goals through the child and his pathological destructive envy of the child and of the child's accomplishments. So on the one hand, the narcissistic parent pushes the child to become what the narcissist had failed to become, to realize the narcissist's unfulfilled dreams and wishes, to accomplish things the narcissist could only dream of. But then when the child does become accomplished, is successful, the narcissist wishes to destroy the child because he experiences uncontrollable, all-consuming envy. And to ameliorate the unease bred by this emotional ambivalence, by this conflict, dissonance, the narcissist resorts to micromanaging the child's life through myriad control mechanisms. And these control mechanisms are guilt-driven, guilt-driven, you know, guilt-tripping the child. I sacrifice my life for you, you owe me. Dependency-driven, I need you, I cannot cope without you. Goal-driven, we have a common goal, which we must accomplish, it's we against the world, or even explicit. If you do not adhere to my principles, beliefs, ideology, religion, set of values, if you don't obey my instructions, if you don't follow the path that I set out for you as your parent, I'm going to impose sanctions on you. Exercise of control helps... Uh, to sustain the illusion that the narcissist, that the child is a part of the narcissist. By controlling the child, the narcissist renders the child an internal object which he can then micromanage and manipulate, an internal object that will never abandon him. And such sustenance calls for extraordinary levels of control on the power, part of the parent and obedience on the part of the child. The relationship is typically symbiotic and emotionally vicissitudinal, and turbulent. The child fulfills another important narcissistic function, narcissistic supply. There is no denying the implied, though often imaginary, immortality 
in having a child. The early natural dependence on the child serves to assuage the fear of abandonment, separation, and security, which is an important driving force in the narcissist's life. The narcissist tries to perpetuate this dependency using the aforementioned control mechanisms. The child is the ultimate secondary source of narcissistic supply. He is always around the child. He admires the narcissist. He accumulates and remembers the narcissist's moments of glory. And owing to the child's wish, innate wish to be loved and cared for, the child can be extorted into forever giving without ever receiving. For the narcissist, as far as the narcissist is concerned, a child is a dream come true, but only in the most egotistical sense. When the child is perceived as reneging on his duties to provide the narcissistic parent with a constant source of in adoration, constant supply, for example. The emotional reaction of the narcissistic parent is harsh and revealing. It is when the narcissistic parent is disenchanted with the child that we see the true nature of this pathological relationship. The child then is totally objectified and rejected. The narcissist reacts to the breach in the unwritten contract between the, him and the child with wells of aggression and aggressive transformation. The narcissistic parents suddenly hold the child, holds the child in contempt, rages at the child, emotionally and physically and psychologically abuses the child. He tries to annihilate the real child brought to the narcissist's awareness through the child's refusal to act the way the narcissist wants him to. And then the narcissistic parents attempts to re replace the existing child with a subservient, edifying version. The narcissistic parents tends to produce another narcissist in the child if the exposure is massive, extensive, intensive, and long-term. Narcissism is contagious. But this outcome can be effectively countered by loving the child, providing an empathetic, predictable, just, and positive upbringing, which would encourage a sense of autonomy and responsibility in the child. Provide your child with an alternative to his father's venomous and exploitative existence, to his, mother overbear his mother's overbearing and domineering and annihilating micromanagement. Trust your child to choose life over death, love over narcissism, human relationships over narcissistic supply. Ultimately, in the vast majority of cases, children make the right choices having become adults and they don't turn out to be narcissists or abusers.